Thanks, TJ. How many of you picked up your USA Today that was outside your door in the hotel? If you looked at the headline, it says, America's new business model, sharing. What a revelation that is. NACOM's goal for a long time has been to share information. And what we're doing here this afternoon is we're going to have a convergence of people and ideas and experiences to talk about a very interesting concept and see what people have experienced using those ideas or what they might intend to do or stay away from in terms of using these principles. But we're also going to have a chance for you to talk about how these could apply or do apply in your local jurisdiction. So in case you think you're in the wrong room, this is the session on a case for court governance principles. We are not here with a mandate to tell you this is what you have to do and this is how you have to do it. We are here to open a discussion of how these principles were developed, why they're important, how they could relate to you, how you might use them, some of the benefits and some of the challenges. We're going to moderate this session through me, so if you have questions later, I'd appreciate if they're directed toward me. But we're going to start with about a 20, 25 minute presentation by Dan Becker. Dan is the state court administrator in Utah, but lest you think that's the only way he thinks, he has court experience in North Carolina and in Georgia way back in the beginning, he said. And Dan is one of the co-authors of a paper that if you don't have, you'll be getting in a few minutes the case for court governance principles. This was the result of a session, an executive session, that lasted about three years long. Talk about meaningful meetings, huh? This was a long process in which Dan and his Chief Justice, then Christine Durham, as well as several other participants in a program at the Kennedy School of Government, worked on issues to help unify court systems. Not in the sense that you have to unify your jurisdiction one way and only do things, but to unify the principles that you operate under. So Dan is going to explain this document and how these principles were arrived at. Then I've got a couple of questions for the panel so they can share their experiences with you. My intent is not to be provocative, it is not to embarrass the panelists, it's not to put them on the spot, or to make you think there's only one right way to implement these if at all. My intent is to stimulate some discussion and hopefully a lot of thinking, even if there isn't as much discussion as there might be right now. Then we will take questions from the audience and I will direct them to the panel so that we can help you figure out how these might apply to you. This session is being recorded, so I would appreciate when it does come time for Q&A, Panelists, I'll remind you, you need to use the mic and I'll bring it back to you. But for the audience as well, there is a mic in the middle and I will help get that out to people so we can make sure we get relevant questions so we can record this for posterity's sake. So if you're all okay with that plan, let me briefly introduce our panelists and that's just to tell you that there is a mix of experiences up here. We have a representation of court administration and the bench. We have a mix of jurisdiction, from limited to general jurisdiction. We have a mix of geography, from Pennsylvania to Minnesota to Ohio and Georgia, I believe, as well as Utah, of course. And if it's relevant, I might even throw in some of my South Dakota experiences. We have Vicki Carlson from Minnesota, Judge Grant Brantley, who is a retired judge but back on the bench. We have Ray Billet and we have Russell Brown, in addition to Dan and myself, bringing some perspective to you. With that, I'm going to introduce now Dan Becker, one of the authors of A Case for Court Governance Principles. Please help me welcome Dan. Thank you, Pat, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Can you hear me okay? Level or no? 
about now? Okay. All right. Um, if you're like me, you've attended many of these programs, and you've heard lots of quotes from pillars of organizational theory. Uh, you know, I'd like to share my own uh, quote from a, an authority, maybe not of organizational theory, but one that you'll recognize. Confidence is what you have before you understand the problem. Uh, I love this quote, and more and more I'm beginning to think it applies to me. Uh, I think I sometimes go off thinking I know far more than what I actually do. So let me say right from the outset that I understand how thorny these issues are. Not so much from a technical standpoint, uh, good organizational theory, there are lots of models for that. But more from the standpoint of the reality that we all live with every day. Governance issues are in the, within the court environment are multi-layered, complex and all too often driven by individual personalities. I come at this issue having worked in three different court systems, as been mentioned, with very different court structures and very different systems of government. governance. In the late 70s, I worked in the state of Georgia, um, which is, has to be one of the most decentralized states in the country, uh, and still is. Uh, where most meaningful decisions were made at the regional level or at the local level. Through the 80s and mid-90s, uh, I worked in the state of North Carolina, uh, one of the most centralized court systems in the country. Uh, at the time, even prosecution and defense were part of the judicial department. Uh, the governance model could best be described in North Carolina as a strong chief justice state court administrator model. Since 1995, I've worked in the state of Utah, uh, a centralized system governed by a constitutionally established judicial council, uh, where all the decisions, uh, meaningful policy decisions, are made by the judicial council. What I've taken away from that 35 years of experience, both at the trial court level and at the state level, is every system believes it's unique, and is. Every system has its strengths and weaknesses. Uh, if there's a perfect system, I haven't found it. And the court officials in every system believe that theirs is the best system because it's the system they grew up with. Uh, I have talked with many of judges uh, and asked them what judi judicial selection system they believe is the best, and invariably they'll tell me that it's the system that put them in office. So what you know is what you think uh, is the best. So while I've given these, I, these issues a great deal of thought, um, like Woody Allen, the only thing I'm confident of is there is no simple or single answer. When Chief Justice Durham and I set out to speak on the issue of court governance, we elected to articulate principles, not answers. In anticipation of the panel discussion, uh, let me try to answer three questions by way of background. Why is governance important? Why these principles and what's been the reaction to them? A couple of caveats. Uh, these principles are not predicated on any particular court structure. They are intended to apply uh, to centralized and decentralized systems, state, local, and mixed funded systems, unified and non-unified systems. They're intended to be relevant and apply both to state governance as well as local governance. And where the term judicial leadership is used, it's intended to be inclusive of both judges and administrators. So why is governance important? Um, the focus on governance, as has been mentioned, uh, came out of the Kennedy School of Governments program entitled Executive Session for State Court Leaders of the 21st Century. Uh, there were about 35 people who participated uh, in this session, including chief justices, appellate and state court judges, state and court 
state and trial court administrators, a legislator, a prosecutor, a journalist, law professors from Harvard, Yale, Columbia, and Cornell, and folks from the National Center for State Courts, the State Justice Institute, and the Bureau of Justice Assistance. We met for three days, twice a year, over a three-year period between 2008 and 2011. And Chief Justice Durham and I had the good fortune of being asked to participate, uh, and Russell was a participant as well. Uh, it was quite the group, and after three days uh, each, of each session, I don't know whether Russell had that experience, had this experience, but I certainly did. My head began to hurt, uh, and I would look forward to returning to the real world where big thoughts weren't expected constantly. Being at Harvard is just more than I can take. I was reminded of why I didn't go to law school. Uh, quite an experience. After two meetings, we seemed to be, seemed to have fallen into a rut of uh, discussing projects and programs. Um, you know, we would spend a lot of time talking about drug courts and different things like that. When, when what I thought was necessary and what the chief and I thought were necessary was is that uh, we needed to have a big picture discussion uh, that might lead to opportunities for more systemic change. Uh, Justice Durham and I offered the proposition uh, that if we failed to address the issue of governance in the courts, the activities of courts would be relegated to just that, a series of projects. We believe that the dialogue, that a dialogue would be improved and the creativity in the room would be better focused by grounding it in a discussion of governance. And we defined governance as a self-governed system. And by that we meant institutional independence to define, organize, prioritize, decide, and administer our branch. And we believe that philosophy should apply to the local court operations as well. Amazingly enough, when we began to study this issue, we found that there had been very lit little written on the subject of court governance. Uh, a lot on governance, but very little on court governance. What had been written didn't so much focus on court governance per se, but assumed a system of gover governance was in place and instead emphasized the relationship with other branches. That preoccupation with other branches is a big part of what we saw as the problem. By focusing on how poorly the courts were being treated by other branches, many courts have used that as an excuse for their problems and often fail to put their own house in order and engage in the kind of decision making that should be expected of a separate branch of government. So rather than taking the well-traveled path of the relationship with other branches, we decided instead to look internally to assume that many of our problems were, in large measure, self-inflicted. Courts are large, complex organizations presiding, providing diverse services, and they're constantly evolving. Yet many of our systems rely disproportionately on the strength of personality or the structure of the court, rather than, objectively, rather than on objective systems of governance. Consider, for example, uh, the following. Uh, many judges see themselves as first independent adjudicators and second, if at all, part of a system. Presiding judges often see themselves as first amongst equals and many have a great deal of difficulty confronting the self-interested perspective that some judges bring to the bench. Professional court administrators are responsible for ensuring, ensuring effective and efficient court operations, but often lack the authority of the chief operating officers uh, in business. There are competing interests of different court levels and state versus local orientations. The culture of the Supreme Court could not be any more different than the culture that exists at the trial court level. Yet in most jurisdictions, it's the Chief Justice or the Supreme Court that sets policy for the entire system. Trial courts often seek autonomy and flexibility, whereas the goals, state goals tend to be more in line with coherence and consistency. And how do all these voices get heard and decisions get made? The failure to provide a consistent message is an invitation to other branches to selectively hear, interpret, 
or ignore, ignore what they're hearing from the courts. So the obstacles and the challenges are many, but that shouldn't be as an excuse for failing to address the question of how our courts are governed, but too frequently that's exactly what's happening. I recently heard Dan Hall of the National Center for State Courts say that 90% of their consulting business involves significant governance issues, even though the initial request said nothing about gov governance. Some of you may be familiar with the Fourth National Symposium on Court Management held in Williamsburg in the fall of 2010. The issue of governance uh, was a major theme of that symposium. And the pre in the preparation for that meeting, the National Center uh, surveyed members of NACOM and other court organizations uh, using the 10 principles uh, that were then 10 uh, that were in draft form at the time. The respondents were asked uh, whether a particular principle should be present, and then they were asked whether in fact it was present uh, in their courts. They had a response of from 350 people throughout the court community. On a scale of one to seven, uh, people were asked to say first whether the principle was not embraced or completely embraced or not present or completely present. And let me just give you a couple of examples of what the survey found. Uh, to principle number two, meaningful input in the decision making process. Uh, received a score of 6.3, meaning that it was almost completely embraced. But yet, whether it was present or not, a score of 3.9. On leadership selected based on competency, not seniority or rotation, a score of 6.2 as opposed to 4.0. On the question of authority to allocate and spend independent of other branches, uh, 6.3 versus 3.6. And then on open communication on how decisions uh, are made and reached, 6.1 versus 3.9. I think these examples suggest a strong agreement with the principle, but a significant dis disconnect between what we believe should be in place and what is actually in place. For these and many other reasons, we felt governance was an important topic that few court systems were given the kind of attention that it deserved. We saw the real question as boiling down to a question of, should we be concerned about the branch of government, in other words, institutional independence, or should we be satisfied with decisional independence for individual judges? We came down on the side of institutional independence and offered 11 principles for discussion. Why these principles and what's been the reaction? The paper went through a number of drafts and ultimately ended up setting out 11 principles. The content was heavily influenced by feedback and comments received both at the Harvard School program that we've mentioned already, a presiding judges forum that was convened by the National Center for State Courts, uh, the fourth national symposium on court management, and discussions around the drafting of principles for court administration, which will be presented to the Conference of Chief Justices and Conference of State Court Administrators next week for approval. Such feedback is, is a, as important as the principle, I believe, so I'll try to give you a sense of what uh, was discussed in each one of these forums when I walk through the principles with you. First, a, a couple of general comments that apply to all 11, 11 principles. Um, heard in many of these different forums. I would say first there was general support for all 11 and the belief that they could be applied to any structure, state or local, unified or non-unified. And then secondly, uh, that that support was frequently in concept. It was almost always a host of qualifiers that inevitably followed. Qualifiers such as the challenges in the implementation. They'll have to be adapted to the environment. Implementation will be dependent on meaningful, by the, 
by the willingness of court leaders to actually lead. Implementation would need to vary based on local culture, structure, and methods of judicial selection. And in many places, implementation would involve a long-term effort uh, requiring incremental goals. I would suggest that these arguments uh, and these type of qualifiers simply make the case of why many systems remain in denial and why the issues of governance often go unaddressed. Uh, this is the hard stuff of court administration. So let me get into the principles themselves, and I'm not going to read each one of these to you. You can cover it yourself, but I'm going to selectively pull out a few um, on each one. The first principle is a well-defined governance structure for policy decision-making and administration for the entire system. The structure needs to be specific, authority well-defined, and easily understood by everyone in the system. I would contend that if the lowest level deputy clerk in your court system doesn't understand how your system is governed, that you've got a problem. Everyone should understand it. How is that to be achieved when courts are by culture and design loosely coupled organizations? Um, at the Kennedy School, it was suggested that courts have a lot in common with universities and professors at universities uh, in terms of their independence uh, and that the governance structure that exists in a university setting, a loosely coupled organization, is akin to that in the courts and I think that there's some truth to that. Second principle, meaning inf meaningful input from all court levels in the decision making process. Quality decisions benefit from multiple perspectives that are experience-based. Uh, if the decisions are going to impact the trial courts, trial court representatives better be at the table. Without meaningful input, at best you get indifference, at worst you get resistance and sabotage. This principle for some uh, in earlier conversations uh, surfaced uh, a disconnect between policy setting and operations. Uh, I heard some pretty disappointing AOC bashing in this conversation. Uh, disappointing because it seemed that some of it was well deserved, unfortunately. Uh, and then there was a comment made by my good friend John Grecian uh, on the panel that exists at the Fourth Symposium who said, this principle is so obvious it's not needed, to which my response was, if it's so obvious, why is it so frequently ignored? And why is it such a problem? Uh, yes, it is obvious. Uh, it's the kind of thing that all of us should uh, embrace and understand. But yet this remains a problem in many jurisdictions. Uh, there isn't meaningful input from all court levels. The third principle, selection of judicial leadership uh, based on competency, not seniority or rotation. Uh, I can get myself into trouble with some of my uh, Chief Justice friends around the country with this one, but I think the comment has been made, and I agree with it, that modern court administrator demands skills that are not part of traditional selection and training. That it's your turn in the barrel is not the way to pick a leader. Too short a term and continuity. Too short a term and continuity is an issue. Too long a term and new leadership is stifled, uh, as it relates to picking a presiding judge. Commitment to transparency and accountability. Uh, you've heard a lot about that at this conference already, and I'm sure you'll hear more. Um, but this principle advocates wide dissemination, including the public, of information on operational and programmatic effectiveness. It's often embraced in concept, but frequently ignored in practice. Sounds good, but we never get around to doing it. <laughs> 
And this is a quote from uh, any number of, of judges that I heard uh, as we've talked about these. Counting activities is fine, just stay away from how it is that I'm performing. And then should performance data be made available at the state, district, courthouse, or individual judge level? And the commitment to this principle seems to wane with increasing specificity. Uh, in Utah, we adopted the court tools, uh, performance measures. Uh, we put them out on our public website. We allowed people to drill down to, at the state level, the individual judicial district level, and even into the individual courthouse level and the world did not come to an end. I can tell you, it didn't come to an end. Some people thought it would. Actually, it was one of the best things we ever did. Fifth principle, a focus on policy level issues, delegation with clarity to administrative staff, and a commitment to evaluation. Governing authorities should not micromanage. The operations need to belong to administration, clearly. Policy decisions need to be informed by evidence-based evaluation. And without a commitment to evidence-based evaluations, courts cannot claim to be well-managed institutions. We found that there is a lot to be said for leading on this front. Uh, we tried to lead in this area in Utah, and the funders have responded extremely well. Sixth principle, open communication on decisions and how they are reached. No one wants to tell judges how to decide cases, although it is a reality that we may need to tell them how to manage case records, report court performance, move to electronic filing, and handle assignments and schedules. Many of you probably think that I wrote that. Actually, that was Chief Justice Durham that wrote that. And I was so proud of her when she said that, I told her, you go, girl. Um, decisions that emerge from a black box are typically, uh, typically engender suspicion, dissatisfaction, and resistance. And this was a point that was made by uh, one of the participants in one of these forums, that the same rationale for procedural fairness in the courtroom applies to administrative decisions. Parties are more satisfied with decisions when they understand the process. We're, sp we're spending an awful lot of time talking about procedural fairness in the courtroom, but procedural fairness exists within an administrative context just as readily. Principle number seven, clear, well understood, well respected roles and responsibilities among governing entity, presiding judges, court administrators, boards of judges, and court committees. It's not enough to reduce roles and responsibilities to writing. Uh, they have to be considered consistently reinforced in the workplace. Um, and legitimacy has to be earned. Uh, no one knows better than the folks in this room that it takes more than a title to lead. Number eight, a system that speaks with a single voice. I would say that there was probably more discussion about this principle than any others uh, in the various forum that we talked about. Because uh, I think the knee-jerk reaction was it's going to stifle dissent. Uh, there's not going to be, if you speak with a single voice and one person is speaking for the branch or the court, uh, then you're not going to be able to uh, uh, have dissent. Uh, that wasn't the intent, and I think a more accurate way of characterizing uh, this principle uh, in retrospect was to, that we should be speaking in terms of a unified message that can be delivered by multiple voices. Same message delivered by multiple people. Competing messages undermine institutional independence and leave others free to choose what they prefer uh, or to ignore us at all. Uh, let me share a little story that Justice Durham uh, tells. Uh, when she was on the trial courts, which was actually many years ago, uh, she made a trip up to the legislative hearing 
to discuss the need for adjusting judicial compensation. Uh, she was representing all the district court judges in the state. And when she was finished making this impassioned plea for additional compensation for judges, the chair of the committee leaned over and said, oh, that's all very interesting, Justice Durham, but the Chief Justice was up here this morning and he said that judges are overpaid. Competing messages. Which one do you think that they're going to pay attention to? Uh, suffice it to say they didn't get a pay raise that year. Number nine, authority to allocate resources and spend appropriated funds independent of the legislative and executive branches. Whoever has the power to direct and use funds has the power to direct policy and priorities for the third branch. Multiple line items undermine the branch's ability to set policy and direct operations. Uh, I don't know that we have anyone here from the state of Massachusetts, but apparently they have in excess of 200 line items. I can't begin to tell you how they administer that system. Uh, in Utah, we essentially have one line item. Uh, and we have complete flexibility with respect to how to manage our system, and I don't know how we would get by without it. So, and most of you are somewhere in between. Uh, this is an issue. Uh, there needs to be discretion for spending at the local level within policy parameters for the system, uh, and budget reductions are causing strains. Uh, have you heard the term, cut everywhere except where it'll impact me? I can tell you I have. Uh, repeatedly. The tenth principle, positive institutional relationships that forward trust, that foster trust among other branches and, and constituencies. Um, the branch may be independent, but it's a mistake to fail to, fail to appreciate that it's also interdependent. Uh, we rely on the executive branch uh, and the legislative branch because of their power of the purse. Uh, and to ignore that uh, is to do it at your own peril. Being independent doesn't mean that you can't appreciate how interdependent you are. And then uh, the last one. Our relationship with the legislature is only as good as the last Supreme Court decision. And there is some truth to that. Uh, the reality is, is that we're going to make funders mad. Uh, if the Supreme Court's doing its job, it's going to come out with decisions from time to time that are going to make the funders upset. And that's why the relationships and the accountability and the transparency of the system are such important principles. And then finally, um, an eleventh principle was added, and this was after the fourth uh, symposium. Uh, this principle reads the judicial branch should govern and administrator, administer operations to the core of the process of adjudication. So what does this mean? Uh, well, this isn't applicable in Utah because of the way we're structured, but apparently in many jurisdictions this continues to be a big issue. Um, and the idea that people were trying to communicate was is that in today's world the judiciary must have control of its record if it's to carry out the role of an independent and separate branch. And how do you reconcile an independent clerk of court within this principle? Uh, this apparently is a big issue in many jurisdictions, uh, and we were impressed enough to add it as an 11th principle. So let me end with where I started. Uh, this is the hard stuff of court administration. This isn't easy. Uh, court governance is an endless struggle between self-interest and institutional needs. Uh, with that in mind, it was our hope to begin a dialogue by suggesting several principles. And judging from the conversation that continues, uh, that modest goal seems to have been accomplished. I was told uh, just the other day that uh, this, this little document uh, it's been out, I think, maybe six or eight weeks is now in its third printing. And so it suggests that we've uh, tapped uh, an issue that was a very important one for many folks, uh, and we hope that that's the case. Um, finally, uh, one last quote. 
good people can make bad structures work, but good people can work even better within good structures. Uh, this is from a colleague, a colleague in Australia, and I think it sort of sums up why it's important to deal with these issues. Thank you very much. All right, now we have to figure out how these microphones are going to work. Is the lavalier working? Are we on now? I will use this one and move this back to the panel. And what I'm going to do is to start by asking each of the panelists to tell us a little bit about themselves and then give us a few minutes of reaction to these principles and how, how they feel about being on this panel maybe. But before I start, let me quickly ask, how many of you have previously seen this document and have read it, just so the panelists have an idea of how informed you might be? Okay, so about half of you have maybe already seen them. All right, let's start with Vicki Carlson. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Vicki, and some reactions to Dan's presentation. Boy, I'm going to have to be good with this crowd. They know too much. Well, good afternoon. My name is Vicki Carlson. I'm the Carver County Court Administrator, which is um, located about 20 minutes southwest of Minneapolis. It's a general jurisdiction court, and I manage the day-to-day -day operations of the court. Uh, we're, I'm in a state unified system, so that I'll tell you maybe a little bit about some of my responses. Uh, overall, I really agreed with the governance principles. I think they are sound, and uh, I think whether or not your state is unified, however, that being said, I do think it's going to be more difficult for states to implement some of these um, principles without being state unified. Um, I look back over the years and think about how Minnesota has been successful in, or pretty successful, I mean, it's comparative, I guess, but I think that we have been pretty successful, and I think it's become because of a number of different reasons. I think um, if you look back at the timing of state unification, it didn't happen overnight. It was a transition that took many years, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. I think it can also be attributed to the times we're in, the budget times that we're in, and why um, people have kind of bought into the principles and state unification as a result. And I think um, desperate times call for desperate measures and people, you know, were willing to do different things in order to save their jobs or somebody else's job. So I just want to tell you a little bit about the history of Minnesota and how state unification came to be. Um, prior to 1972, Minnesota had probate courts, county courts, district courts, uh, juvenile courts. And in 1972, um, that changed and there was a move to county courts and district court. So for many of you, that could be compared to, uh, county court could be compared to limited jurisdiction courts. And in the 1980s, uh, Minnesota consolidated all their county courts into district courts, into general jurisdiction, and that really happened about the time I came on board with the courts in 1986. And then in 1990 began the um, funding to state or the transition to state funding for one of our districts. And just so you know how our districts are laid out, we have 10 judicial districts in Minnesota and um, with 10 district administrators who handle like the HR, the finance, the IT. And then there used to be 87 count court administrators because we had 87 counties in Minnesota. And since that whole transition, we're now down to about 52. So we have some administrators who are managing multiple counties. There's one that's managing four counties. I'm still uh, managing one county. Uh, and then in the two th early 2000s, the transition really picked up momentum and um, more districts uh, became state funded. In 2005, our state funding was complete, or state transition to state funding and unification was completed. <clears throat> 
So with that being said, it has not come without challenges, and I hope to have an opportunity later on to talk about some of those challenges that we've faced and that I've faced personally as a uh, court administrator. Thank you. Thanks, Vicki. And now we'll ask Grant Brantley to tell us a little bit about himself and his reaction. Good afternoon, almost, isn't it? All right, everybody wake up now. <laughs> I was elected in 1980 uh, in a contested race against the incumbent uh, and have served since that time as a trial judge in the Court of General Jurisdiction. I'm from Cobb County, Georgia, which is part of the Atlanta metropolitan area. Uh, I was introduced earlier as a retired judge, uh, but I'll tell you just how retired I am. Since the first of this year, I've had only 12 days off the bench. Um, I'm enjoying my retirement. <laughs> uh, what I say is just one man's opinion and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of my colleagues back home in view of the fact that this is being recorded. <laughs> uh, but I remind myself that um, these are very good rules, uh, governance, uh, principles, however you want to... Uh, refer to them. I have no quarrel with them. I agree with them. Some, in some ways, they're aspirational, uh, but the devil is always in the details, and we need to remember that. Where rules are concerned, I think that, at least for me, that court administration is organized around case flow. That is to say, taking the cases, the public business, from filing to final disposition and moving those cases quickly, efficiently, cost-effectively, through the system, all giving due deference and consistency with substantive and procedural due process. So I think every time we create a principle that we apply to what we do in the courts, it's got to directly or indirectly affect that goal because that's what we're there for. Um, my reaction is, some of the things you've talked about uh, have been implemented in my jurisdiction. Some uh, may never be. Um, the reason being that it's always about the people that are involved in the particular process. Thank you. Thanks, and now we'll ask Ray Billet from Pennsylvania. Good afternoon. Um, as, uh, my name is Ray Billet. I'm the district court administrator for the 5th Judicial District, and that's in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, we are a state um, that are not unified in our funding um, systems. We have, uh, as probably those of you who are not unified know that there are various forms of, and mechanisms by which we get our funding, including federal, state, local uh, dollars, as well as fines and fees. Um, my, uh, and just to give you a little background on, this, on the size of our jurisdiction, we have uh, 93 judicial officers about 1,300 employees do business in about 70 different sites. And, um, you know, as I, I'll be quickly with, do my initial comments quickly, but I'll save some for later, but as I looked at these and read through them, I mean, I'm certainly, how can I as a trial court administrator not agree with, with all of these principles? I mean, to me, they're, they're quite simple, straightforward. But I also look at them from a, given the background I just told you, from a, from a uh, perspective that uh, we enjoy autonomy, I guess, a little bit of freedom at the local level. And I think when I look at this, and I, I know my friend David sitting there now, state court administrator, I've never been a state court administrator. I don't know how state court administrators look at this, but some of the things concern me a little bit when we're talking about if we're talking about a statewide policy implementation of, of issues. And so, again, maybe I'm overreacting, but now I look at it, my, my initial concern is I don't want to lose freedom and autonomy at the local level because I think if we do that, we lose, at least we run the risk of losing things like innovation and ability to deliver services that the, our communities need. Again, I'm not saying that these are written that way and, and necessarily do that, but those are the reactions that I first had. Because um, I, I think in my uh, travels around this, this country, some of the best innovations and some of the best programs we have in our courts today come from courts that have this freedom to do that at the local level. So 
Um, that I'll pass it on. All right, and I will ask Russell to go ahead and give us his thoughts. Hi, uh, Russell Brown, uh, court administrator at Cleveland Municipal Court, which I thought was a large uh, urban district uh, until my partner here from Pittsburgh uh, has 93 judges. I work with 12 uh, general division judges, and we have one housing court judge. My, and I will say perspective-wise, Ohio is also a non-unified -jur uh, non jurisdiction. Uh, but I will go so far as to say, having looked around the room, that um, probably with confidence in, in, in our lifetime, Ohio will not become a unified state. Uh, and I know that we're recording right now as well. But I will say that um, when I look at the principles and um, I look at them as so foundational and, and, and yes, so obvious that they do apply and uh, not only to Ohio, which I'll just talk briefly about, but I look at them as how they, to, how they apply to my own court. And again, they're, to me, so foundational, just like, you know, you know the language you use. Every now and then, you know, you want to get that precise definition, you go to a, a dictionary. When, when you look at uh, trying to become a more effective and efficient operation uh, for our court, I believe these are sort of definitional for how you do that. Um, so although Ohio is not a unified state, I will say that um, thanks to our, our past Chief Justice, and, and, and I think it's continuing with our current Chief Justice, they've been very strategic about uh, trying to weave in uh, standards and accountability so that ultimately uh, the judicial branch is responsive uh, to the public, and and we know from our um, you know past few years of, of uh, scrutiny and and budget uh, crisis type that it is important to be responsive and to be accountable to our public. So I will say that Ohio has, uh, through its education, uh, through its um, you know having some very talented and. Uh, um, you know, expertise and staff that supports the various courts in their own case management uh, flow and, uh, you know, setting the right standards and, and that, that everyone can adhere to around the state, I believe they're doing their best to, again, set a standard that all courts will try and at least meet but not coming down as mandates. And they have a number of advisory committees that uh, you know, bring uh, multiple levels together and diversity and, and come out with rules that pretty much apply to more than, again, just a, you know, unified, this is the way it's going to be done and it's a one-size-fit-all, which we know generally does not work. Uh, I will tell you uh, briefly that uh, in looking at my own court, um, you know, in terms of uh, speaking with one voice, uh, we have, my court is known in, in Ohio for a number of special programs and, and we just had one come under scrutiny uh, for questioning, you know, how effective it was with certain graduates where we make them or help them get, uh, you know, their high school diplomas and, and not recidivate. And yet we had a judge who uh, took that very defensively and, and, and was, you know, with one of the investigative reporters, really gave a presentation that, you know, we're independent and we don't have to answer you know to the media and one thing that was helpful uh, obviously again we you know judges are autonomous uh, and this judge was pretty much close to this program so in some ways it's understandable but in the end you had an, an administrative judge who's able to also um, you know the reporters can come to and they get an additional perspective and in this case uh, he was able to identify, yes, we're, we're reviewing this, and yes, we did bring in some evaluators to take a look at the program, but the important thing is, you know, it's not just having one voice. Sometimes you do have to rely upon um, the authoritative person uh, for some additional perspective. And in that instance, the um, AJPJ in each court, I believe, is crucial in speaking for the bench even when he or she cannot control uh, the message coming from each of the individual judges. Um, so the, the last thing I will say, again, as a matter of uh, example, um, I, I was a part of the group at the symposium that, that um, a number of groups did bring out this uh, 11th principle, talking about the, uh, for example, the clerk of court, the court owning its own sort of core 
uh, being able to you know, govern and manage some of its core operations. Uh, I can give you an example uh, just again recently, this past uh, week, uh, our, our general division court uh, in the Cleveland area is trying to get a, a control over its clerk of court. We had some corruption in the county recently and the county was able to, uh, you know, the, in fact the last county commissioner, uh, the lead county commissioner is, is in jail right now. So the county turned the system over and turned it over to a, a county executive as opposed to elected county commissioners. One of the things they did is they moved the appointment of various positions. So instead of uh, a number of elected positions, you know, for example, the clerk of court is now an appointed position, and it's appointed by the executive. Uh, two comments came out from the uh, one of the hearings recently, and our common pleas court um, is trying to rewrite the law, quite frankly, through an amendment to say the court is the one that should be appointing its, um, you know, clerk of court. And I understand this can be controversial, but I'm just going to state uh, a couple comments that came out of the hearing, again, just for perspective, that if you don't clarify roles and authority, you have some other ideas that float out there that, that could be surprising. And in this instance, um, there was one perspective from the county executive that said, well, we've done a much better job of, um, you know, making it more efficient by increasing its collections and so forth. And it occurred to me that, um, yes, but as an executive, they had an opportunity to actually go in and manage and run that operation, whereas the judges respecting the previous elected clerk was letting the clerk do his job. So therefore, they're sort of uh, falsely being compared to an oversight by the court that really wasn't in effect at the time. And just one other comment I'll say, uh, another county um, council member basically raised, well, wait a minute, um, we need the, the clerk to stay as part of the executive because it's a check on the judicial branch. It's a check on the judges. And again, that's a perspective that um, is quite interesting, and, and I'm sure it's probably not a common view, but the bottom line is, again, without having control over um, your core operations, it does leave room for interpretations like that. So I believe the principles uh, do apply both in your, can apply in your individual courts if you uh, take a look at them, and, and through even states that are not unified as well. Thank you. Thank you, panel. As further illustration of what's big and what's small and how you're going to have to use your own local court to make your decisions, I work for the state of South Dakota. I'm the state court administrator. That tension between the trial courts and the AOCs does exist. By way of reference, I have 42 trial court judges in my entire state and 13 magistrates who work within our court system. We call ourselves a unified judicial system, but we're very careful to say that does not mean we are uniform. And if you think that doesn't present its own challenges, I invite you to think again. But Regardless of what your jurisdiction is, whether you are state-funded or county-funded, whether you are elected or whether you are appointed, there are ways that you can work these principles into what you're doing. This morning, I was furiously taking notes when Dr. Andringa was talking about the principles for boards, and I found several similarities between Dan's paper and Dr. Andriga's principles this morning. They both talked a lot about the impact of the local culture, and although it's not a specific principle in the case for court governance principles, it is certainly a dimension that lays over the top of all the rest of them. There is also the importance of having structured governance and defined principles and roles in common. The competency level of the board or your judicial leadership was a similarity in these principles. The commitment to transparency and accountability. The preference for evidence-based management. And in a minute, I want to talk a little bit about Dan's comment. You may have heard him refer at one point to experience-based management. 
and then evidence-based management. And I'd like to clarify what that distinction is. There was also a similarity in the need for documented and communicated decisions and policies. And yet there were a couple of differences. Dr. Andriga's principles didn't touch on funding principles. They didn't really talk about the relationship that is so particular to courts and where I find courts get defensive in asserting their judicial independence with the legislative branch and the executive branch. And so Dr. Andriga talked about partnerships and alliances, but not necessarily that tension that exists between the branches of government, which Dan alluded to in the judicial branch having control over those core operations. So I think there are several similarities, no matter what source you're going to use, all the arrows seem to point to, it's our job, I think, to take care of these principles and to set the structure that we want to work within. But that's not to say they are without challenges. And Vicki alluded to some of the challenges that she has experienced in Minnesota, so I'd like to ask her to expand on that just a little bit. You know, I think Ray alluded to this a little bit, and I think, you know, the main, uh, you know, challenge I've seen from the trial court administrator perspective has been really the loss of autonomy, and Ray touched on that a lot, and the loss of innovation in the local court. Uh, we recently did an interview with one of my colleagues, and I just want to read a little bit of that interview, and you can kind of see how the court administrator position has evolved. He, is, he was asked, what was the hardest part about being a court administrator? And his response was, the authority and the duties of the court administrator have changed drastically since 1971. The position has slowly evolved from a totally autonomous county department head where the incumbent was responsible for all the department's personnel, budget, policies, and initiatives to more of a manager who is responsible to implement and oversee the policies and initiatives derived by somebody else. So you can see right there, it's just, I mean, it creates that power struggle and that was a big challenge and we still work with that every day with our AOC on, you know, receiving those policies and then kind of being forced to implement them. So that is a challenge we face. Now on the other hand, I look at that as an opportunity and I look at who we're trying to serve and it's the public. It's the public who has certain expectations that we're trying um, to meet. And so I've been really, internally, I struggle with that, and I try to balance those needs as well. Uh, he went on to say that um, he has had to put aside his personal feelings and the changes and the losses that he has had. And, um, but he does go on to say that he feels the many changes uh, that are coming and have happened are in the best interest of the judicial system of the state of Minnesota. And, you know, he couldn't have said it better, and I think he put a... Um, a face on that for all of us and what many of us have felt with the loss of autonomy. I'd ask any of the other panel members if you have a specific challenge you'd like to tell us about that you have faced or expect you will encounter if you try to implement these in your jurisdiction. <laughs> Ray said go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of these I, I think uh, I can safely say we've we've implemented, um, but we have uh, judges of all ages on the bench. We have one that's a little more than 30, and we have one that is 91 and still sitting. Uh, they come from different schools of thought. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, there's a, a good bit of... Uh, if it ain't broke, don't try to fix it kind of attitude. And the other is, wait a minute, I got elected just like you did and I'll run my court the way I see fit and I'm not gonna defer to you on how the public perceives me because you want me to run it like you run it. So as I indicated in my first remarks, uh, you can't separate this stuff from the people that's involved and we must always remember our public relations I think we can all agree that you can't separate the people from the issues, but I have to ask Dan quickly, are these principles prioritized in any way? <laughs> 
because it's overwhelming to think about where to start. They're not intended to be. Um, you know, for example, I, I might consider the most important principle to be meaningful input from all court levels in the decision making process. Um, because if you don't have such meaningful input, uh, meaningful input in the decision making process, a well defined governance structure is just that well defined, but little else. Um, so uh, they're really not prioritized in any way, at least not in my view. Okay. So if they're not prioritized, picking one means you have to figure out either where your biggest weakness is or, as I go about it, sometimes where am I going to have my first success so I can live long enough to do some of the rest of them. Ray, where do you start? Well, I would just, as I looked at these, again, I would suggest, I mean, there may not be a priority, but I would suggest to you that the ability to allocate resources to spend appropriated funds, that without having a clear commitment to transparency and accountability is disaster waiting to happen. So I would suggest that, obviously, you know, as a court system, you would need to make sure you are both transparent and accountable um, before having that final authority. Um, for me, I mean, as, as, again, as I looked at these, um, and just to follow up on a, and ask a question you had here, I think for, for me the most difficult thing, one of the more difficult things right now would be having a selection by competency. Um, I'm from a court that basically follows that, that river of who's next, who's the next person in line. Um, so that would be difficult for us to, to implement. Um, so I don't, did I answer your question? <laughs> you did. Okay. Thank you. Well, as you can tell, there are a lot of ways to look at all of these issues. As a state court administrator, I like to think that funding is something that judges should not be involved in unless I need their muscle to help me through some of the discussions in lobbying for that funding. And Ray has just alluded to, you can't do the funding without the accountability and the transparency. Russell, let me ask you, when it comes to funding, or when it comes to any of the other issues, who should be the champion? Does it matter which principle you're trying to work on, or do you need one person out there leading the charge? I believe one person should lead the charge, but I would defer back to the explanation that you should have many voices also um, on the same, you know, message. Uh, and to me, the person generally that leads that charge is the, um, you know, person with the authority, administrative judge in a local court, or as stated before, our chief justice um, in the Supreme Court. And and it takes, uh, and you know, we we live in a culture that that really respects authority. And uh, you actually need a visionary in that position to help move the orientation from uh, this is the way we've always done it and, and it works to uh, answering some of the expectations and some of the um, asking the better questions to get to a more responsive uh, branch. So in general, I think there should be a lead and, I, and, and while it, it's difficult for that person, uh, it should be the chief judge Chief Justice or the Administrative Judge of a Court. Okay, let's turn, I think it was Principle 5 that Dan alluded to evidence-based decision making. And yet earlier he also used the comment about experience-based. And Grant has just commented that you can't separate the people. And in my experience, the people are that experience-based component and the evidence is something else. So when we talk about evidence-based versus experience-based, Dan, why don't you start by telling us why you're advocating for evidence-based and what that means? Now maybe I can give you a, an illustration. Uh, five years ago, uh, we had you know, dozens of juvenile court programs, and our state juvenile probation is part of the court system. Uh, and we had lots of programs out there at the court level. Uh, Many of them the, the brainchild of the local presiding judge and the court executive or the local local community organization. And uh, each one of these programs, because they, they owned it, uh, was the best program. Uh, and 
When we got into difficult budget times, we began questioning were all these programs, in fact, effective? Uh, anecdotally, experience-based, uh, they were all wonderful. They were all doing terrific things. Uh, but we decided to ask the question in a different way, and we contracted with the University of Utah, and they now do all of our program evaluation. And using evidence-based practices, they set up a, a tool uh, in which they assessed each one of these programs. Very few of those programs exist today. Uh, under the experience-based method, uh, they all were found, many of them were found to be completely lacking. Uh, uh, they actually, in some instances, did more harm than good. Uh, and we now have put programs in place that are evidence-based, where we know that they're working. Uh, we know what the results will be. We know how we're spending our money and that the money is spent wisely. So when I use the term experience-based, uh, it's mostly anecdotal. Uh, there's a place for it, um, but a more limited place, uh, at least in our system. We're moving much more to a, an evidence-based model where we can prove to funders uh, uh, and to ourselves and to the people who are receiving the service uh, that the programs that we have in place are, in fact, making a difference. Thank you. We have about 15 minutes or so for questions from the audience. Otherwise, I get to ask all the rest of the questions. Who has the first question? Would you come meet me in the middle so we can use the mic? Thank you. Uh, Dan, this is a, a question for you. You said when you posted performance information on your website, the, the sky didn't fall. Mm -hmm. But presumably, clouds gathered. Maybe they parted. I don't know. But the, <laughs> <laughs> Things looked differently. So I'm just wondering, a commitment to these principles, particularly the one that deals with uh, accountability and transparency, you, you jump in, right, and you, and you gather information. In this case, you posted it. You've got to recommit along the way, right, because you're going to learn something about, uh, about the data you gather. And I'm just wondering, how, how did the information you gather, the way you got it out there, um, how did, if at all, did that change any of your Judicial Council's governance practices, for example? Well, we actually use the Judicial Council as the, the body by which we assessed each one of the court tools. Uh, we didn't rush into it. Uh, the court tools were published by the National Center, uh, then we began talking about them, uh, and then we used a, a full year uh, with taking one principle for each meeting. We counsel Judicial Council in our state meets once a month, and we would set aside a workshop at the end of the business meeting for an hour and a half or two hours, and we would go over each one of the principles, and we would debate it, discuss it. Uh, information was put together and presented to the council on what the data would look like if it were published, um, and then we would tentatively approve each one and began pilot testing them as we approved them. So over the course of the year, by the time we were finished with a year, and in the meantime, we're cleaning up data as well so that we're not publishing uh, data that people are not comfortable with. Uh, at the end of the year, the council was comfortable enough to approve them and put them out. And we also made the decision that if we were going to go down this track, we were going to make them available to everyone. We were going to put them on our website. We were going to uh, make the legislature aware of it, make the executive branch aware of it. Uh, and that's exactly what we did. We got virtually no pushback uh, from uh, judges or court staff uh, about these principles. Now, I have to acknowledge that in our state, uh, transparency and accountability has long been embraced because judges are subject to performance evaluation. There is a culture of that. Uh, so it's a little bit different than what you find in some places. Uh, but the legislature in, particularly, in particular was very complimentary. Uh, and remain so. Even you know, five, six years later, uh, they continue to compliment the judiciary on our leadership. Uh, and it's very good to be able to be having a, an appropriation hearing and have uh, a legislator uh, ask a question, and I can sit there on a laptop and pull it up on their screen and say, let's take a look at your particular, where your, where your district is. This is the situation in your district. And our view is, is that um, you shouldn't be afraid of data, um, that 
if the data is saying that generally court data in our state is very positive. Uh, we're very proud of the work that we do. But where we're not, we should be addressing it anyway. Uh, and the only way that you can address it is to know that it's a problem. Uh, so we have, we have relatively few problems, and where we do, we can speak to how we're addressing it. So it's proven to be a very positive thing in Utah. Wow, did he just say no pushback? That's an interesting concept. Let me ask the other panelists, just by a quick show of hands, do you use evidence-based decision-making, evidence-based management in your jurisdiction? Uh, practices. Uh, decision-making, no. We use evidence-based practices. Evidence-based practices, but not evidence-based decision-making. Would you like to grab the mic and explain that distinction briefly? Well, I guess that when you, when you say decision-making, I apply that to judicial officers. Um, what we use are evidence-based practices in both our pretrial and post-trial processes in our criminal, um, in our criminal case flows. As um, a matter of fact, my pretrial services director is sitting in the rear here, so she, she's giving a presentation on this, um, um, actually, the next session here. So, so we're using those to help and, and use those to give to judicial officers as recommendations. Now, they don't have to use them, but often, often they do. When you're talking, when, when you ask, ask that question, I immediately interpret that to judges on the bench when they're making a determination of what sentence to um, give you. Are they using some of these tools? A at this point, no, they're not. Evidence-based. Um, All right. Other panel members, do you use evidence in making your decisions on the bench or evidence in making your management decisions either? No, I always ignore the evidence. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> I think there is a distinction between judges using evidence to make a decision about sentencing or bail or those kinds of things but I'm curious about who uses evidence, especially as Dan alluded to in terms of transparency and accountability and posting data about your cases, not necessarily the ultimate decision on them. Um, Russell, but you were gonna say something? Yes, oh, <clears throat> excuse me. I was just gonna just give a touch of detail to the tension right now between my administrative judge and then one of his colleagues. And quite frankly, um, it's with the, a number of the colleagues we, for the first time, uh, brought in a local university to evaluate the programs. And there was probably uh, eight or nine programs that were evaluated. And based upon the results, um, the evaluators, uh, professional, you know, found a number of flaws in some of the programs. Uh, and some of them, quite frankly, was, was challenged as post potentially causing a little bit of harm uh, to the constituency there. And yet, in, in the way of trying to uh, address some of the concerns, um, the administrative judge finds himself, um, you know, finds a bench that's pretty much non-responsive to, you know, the, the results from the um, evaluations simply because, you know, who asked for the evaluations to be done? And these are quite frankly, very good programs already, and, and they may not need some of these uh, modifications that's being recommended. And so, again, we're, we're, we're wanting to be evidence-based, uh, but it takes, again, a, a certain orientation to say, yes, we're willing to look at that, and even though there may be risk that this is, you know, a little bit different than I imagined it, it was, it gives us an opportunity to make correction and ultimately to make them better programs because, uh, again, the media picked up that, you know, there were some flaws in the program strictly on their own and they were able to then validate it through looking at the reports and, and that's why we need to review things like that. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? First of all, thank you for your sharing of this information. I think these are wonderful aspirational principles. Um, I'm seeking some advice from each one of you because I am personally witnessing and experiencing and sharing with my colleagues around the country, large courts and small courts. I am not seeing these principles in operation. And the question is how best to introduce these things to new leadership judges. What I am personally seeing is not wide input, not collaboration, 
And yet, the individual who's now leading the court has all of the experience and the credentials to have been appointed as the leader. And part of it is micromanagement. Part of it is the grounding of a law-trained judge and a non-law-trained administrator, the judicial part of the operation, the non-judicial part. These are great aspirational principles, but what experience do you have or suggest on how to introduce these things to a judge who is new to the leadership role and who may be inclined to think in a silo manner or think because they've had many years as a lawyer and a judge, they know about the wide array of court management issues. Big question, sorry. Let's start with Grant, since he mentioned he's got judges that he works with from about 30 to 91, and they obviously went to the different schools of thought he mentioned. How do you reconcile the needs with that education and that expectation? What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I'm really kind of serious. <laughs> I don't really know how to answer that because uh, you were talking about lawyer trained judges, you were talking about non-lawyer trained judges, and uh, they're so different uh, that I have no idea. We, we have an orientation through our uh, state judges council for new, new judges. Um, we have a certain amount of, a um, certain number of hours of continuing judicial education that uh, judges at all levels are required to take, usually having two conferences a year, because somebody's got to stay home and preside while the others go learn how to be judges. Um, that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> Let's ask. I, I don't, I don't, you got different levels. You've got superior courts, you've got state courts with limited jurisdiction, you've got juvenile courts, you've got magistrate courts, you've got probate courts, and they handle different kinds of business. So there's no one shoe fits all sizes. Which is part of what Janet was alluding to is that there, how do you get started when you have all those factors at play? And in particular with the leadership judge. The, well, a judge the, newly appointed to be the leadership judge and now the court administrator is struggling on how to expose them to all these great aspirational um, ideas and take them out of being a courtroom-based judge to a system leader. Well, just tell the uh, court administrator to come to NACOM's <laughs> conference and tell the judges to go to National Judicial College and come back home and collaborate. <laughs> Let me ask, let's Ray, start with... Ray wanted to jump in on this. Well, well, go I, ahead, I, Ray. Where's Janet? Where did she go? Uh, obviously, there's no... There's no uh, absolutely, at least in my opinion, answer to this. But from, I think, our perspective as court managers and dealing with, over the years, new presiding judges who come in on, you know, one of the things that we've always tried to do in my jurisdiction as the presiding judge, and I try, to, to, and we've done it with, I've done it with everyone with the exception of the very first one that I worked for in Pittsburgh. We try to attend leadership um, educational training sessions together to try to develop that core executive component. That's the first, in my opinion, the first thing you have to have because you have to understand your issues here, the differences between your styles, how you do business. So I certainly think that is the first step. That by no means gets you to, to implementing all these, but there are certainly these principles certainly will arise in that, in that uh, session you have um, uh, you know, with them. And from there, I, I think, Jenny, you build upon them. You know, I, as I look at this, I, I look at uh, number one, a well-defined governance structure. Mm, I have a defined governance structure, but it's not well-defined. <laughs> so I move on. So there are always issues that you can improve upon, but um, you know, I, I certainly, as I said, I aspire, would aspire to all of them, but I don't know how, I mean, sometimes I, I, you just have to say, well, maybe not that. I mean, you know, this, the, speaking as a one voice, I think that's terrific but it will never happen in my jurisdiction. So I learn, you learn another way to deal with that. Um, so. Dan has a comment, but before we give it to Dan, I'd like to go to Vicki for a minute. Mm -hmm. I know that Minnesota has a pretty extensive orientation program for new judges. I'm curious, do you have a similar kind of orientation program for judicial leaders, new chief judges in Minnesota or anything like that? 
You know, I, I'm not, I guess I'm not really sure. Um, we do have an executive board in our district, and um, that executive committee or whatever is made up of judges and some administrators who, uh, you know, handle policies just for our district aside from the Judicial Council. And so I know they work on some of those. We have uh, a district administrator who's actually standing behind you. He might be, be better able to answer that, answer that for you. All right, let's go over to Dan, and then if Jerry has a comment, we can let him touch on that. I think it's an excellent question, Janet. Uh, a couple of things. Um, in Utah, maybe six or seven years ago, we began having uh, meetings of presiding judges and court executives. Uh, we now meet quarterly. We have educational programs where uh, we get together uh, and discuss these issues, but probably the most important thing in terms of the success of talking about principles is all of our presiding judges attend, including the Chief Justice as a presiding judge, and including the judge of the Court of Appeals as the presiding judge. Uh, and we look to them to model what we expect and what the conversation is going to be. And so including them as presiding judges has elevated the conversation, and they talk about these kinds of issues uh, in a, a very engaging way. And so the conversation now, you know, seven years later is very different uh, when we get the presiding judges and court executives together than what it was years ago. Uh, years ago it was about, you know, case reports. Now it's about outcomes. It's about uh, program effectiveness. Uh, it's about governance and being an effective presiding judge. The only other thing I would mention is uh, don't let uh, the or take advantage of the fiscal crisis that uh, is there right now. There's nothing like getting people's attention when you're dealing with difficult budget situations because they will think about things differently uh, when times are tough than they will when times are good. And uh, these issues can be woven into that as well. In my experience, Dan is right. It's a lot harder to start something when you're already in the middle of it than when you're taking something that hasn't existed and trying to bring it to life. But let me go back and ask Jerry Winter, who is the district administrator for the first district in Minnesota, real quickly. What does Minnesota do for their judges in addition to their new judge orientation? Well, actually, I wish there was more. Um, the a new chief judge, uh, when they come on the um, Judicial Council, is briefed on really the operation of the administrative portion of the state court system and how the Judicial Council works. But um, of late, we have fallen away from really talking about uh, the executive component relationship of a presiding judge or chief judge and local or district administrators. And I think one of the things that we need to do in Minnesota is revisit that. We used to do it, and when uh, over the last five years we've gone away from that. Um, so I, one of the things I'm coming away from this conference along with reevaluating the Judicial Council on a more regular basis. Thank you. Well, we could spend a lot of time talking about any a number of these questions, but we're going to be out of time. So I'd like to offer a quick summary, and that is centered around this. We've talked about the principles, we've talked about the challenges, but please remember there are benefits to doing this and if you only focus on the challenges you might never get started. The benefits as I've heard them described include not only an efficient court system but a more fair, procedurally fair process and some better ways to do things, best practices and more objective, reliable information. Having that common vision helps you move forward. Having helpful and productive support in place for the people who are the leaders will make everybody get the warm, fuzzy feeling and want to participate in what's going on. And that shared understanding of the opportunities and the threats empowers the leadership in the judiciary to keep moving forward on the issues that are so important to us. I wish we had more time to go into this. I'm glad we have provoked your thinking. Please help me in thanking our panelists, Vicki Carlson, Grant Brantley, Ray Billet, Russell Brown, and Dan Becker.